I will tell you today about uh, CBDC, uh, Central Bank Digital Currency. And with a specific focus, you've heard a lot, of course, already about CBDC, about offline payments. And the question I want to ask, uh, I, I want to try to answer today, the question I want to, us to think about, we will introduce CBDC, which is basically digital cash. Would it be acceptable that digital cash is not as good as current cash? Would it be acceptable that we go backwards instead of going forward? Um, and this is the question, this is what offline is about, so let me let me get started. So I'm uh, Jerome Maidenbaum. I'm in charge of uh, crypto and digital uh, currencies with Idemia. Uh, what is the difference between crypto and digital currency? When I'm talking, please don't listen here to central banks. I don't say that I'm working on cryptocurrencies and vice versa, because there is a little bit of um, antagonism, I would say, between the two. So uh, yeah, crypto and digital currencies. So let's start with um, why do we need offline payments? Offline payments mean you're able to transact even when you don't have a connection. Um, so today, again, my question, the question I want to answer is how do we build a digital cash that is at least as good as cash and maybe, and we'll see later, maybe if we can do better than cash. And today, cash works all the time. It never goes down. When you pay with your credit card, sometimes, not often, but sometimes uh, it doesn't work. So you fall back to cash. But cash always works. It's what we call the anywhere, anytime paradigm. Uh, anywhere means you can be uh, downstairs in the network dead zone. Uh, you can have whatever conditions. Cash will work because it's an offline device, and I can give you a banknote, it will always works. Anytime, very close, when you have a natural disaster, when you have a network outage, whatever happens, you can still pay cash. The third part is maybe a little more tricky, but very important, it's about financial inclusion. Cash works for everyone because it's a public good. So you don't need a smartphone, you don't need anything. Cash is really for everyone. And cash is a tool, uh, a way of financial inclusion. But of course, it's not enough, because cash is not enough to have a real financial inclusion. Digital cash can be a way to do financial inclusion. The idea is that, of course, people will use smartphones for CBDC, especially in developed economies. But not everyone. Some people don't have the money to get a smartphone a little bit in developed economies, a lot in emerging economies, uh, or some people don't have the money to pay for a data uh, plan. And after, some people don't have the technical literacy, don't have the, uh, and we are not talking about financial inclusion, but more digital inclusion uh, to use a smartphone for a CBDC. Again, many people will, but some people won't. And when we develop uh, something like digital cash, we want it to work for everyone. And again, this is true in different ways, both in developed uh, economies and emerging economies. Now there is a consensus everywhere that we need offline uh, for CBDC here. I'm showing a chart from the, the BIS, which is focused, this chart specifically, on uh, emerging countries. And basically, we are asking central bankers all over the place in emerging countries, Africa for the purple, blue-purple bar, and all emerging countries for the yellow-orange bar, uh, what is the single most important feature that we need to build in CBDC? And you see that there is really a, 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 big, a, a big trend towards uh, offline. So we, we are building some offline solution. So what is um, an offline solution? So I will go uh, um, quickly on some part of this because it's not what I want to say today. Uh, first, we do not offer enough a full CBDC solution. We offer only the offline layer. Something important when you consider the design of your CBDC 
don't forget that it will be a two-tier structure with the central bank and the commercial bank. Take this into account. Everything, you will have to deal both with the first tier and the second tier. Just to give you a very, very simple example, the central bank will say that the maximum balance that you can have on your account is 3,000, say, euros. And then the commercial bank maybe will say, yeah, but me, 3,000 is too much. I want to limit it to 2,000 on my accounts. Not four, it's not allowed by the central bank. But below, they can differentiate. Simple example. Last point, how do you interact? How do you pay in CBDC? And we want to offer freedom. And I believe freedom will be important. Some people will want to pay, for example, with NFC. NFC is very easy. Merchants like to accept NFC. But maybe some people won't be equipped, and maybe it will be legal tender, so they will have to accept it. So something like QR code will be more accessible. So the idea of having different ways to make transactions, different devices. I will want to pay with my phone. You will want to pay with a plastic card. You will want to pay with a wearable. OK, it needs to support all these different approaches. So what do, what do you need in an offline payment solution? So offline, again, means that you don't have a, a network. You cannot connect, contra you cannot connect sorry, to the network. What does it mean? It, it means different things. First, in terms of security, when I talk about security, you need to do things well, because you have nobody to back you uh, if it goes wrong. And of course, because it's digital cash, and remember the point where I got started, we want to digital cash to be as good as cash at least. So we want real offline. We want instant finality. I pay you, you've got the money instantly. You don't need to go online later at any time to clear, settle, no, no instantly the value is transferred. And the best proof that it is transferred is that you can respend it instantly. A pays B, B pays C, C pays D, etc., etc. There is no limit to the number of free transfers. That's quite important, because this, this is what cash does today. No limit to the number of free transfers. Well, no limit to the number of free transfers, except if a central bank wants to add some limits. And this is for the, why would a central bank require uh, something like this? For security reasons, I will talk about security. Everybody trusts the chips. But just in case, let's have a second layer. So from time to time, you want to check what's going on. You may want also to do some AML checks, uh, even if it's a little bo bit more um, complex, not from a technical perspective, but from a privacy perspective. And I'll talk about that in, in one moment. Security, instant finality. So I pay you, instantly you have the money. So obviously, what you want to avoid is that this device who take the wallet, who will take the decision to authorize a payment, to authorize a payment that will be final, this device, you need to trust it. And we believe that the only way to trust the device is to use a secure element, a chip. I, I, I don't have the time to go into the details, but today, what are the alternatives? If you don't use a chip, you use software, and software, we know today if you have an app on your smartphone, even if you use a so-called trusted execution environment, there are already some known attacks today. Already today, we know how to extract private key, typically, from software or from a trusted execution environment. And the cost, the cost is not really high. You can go on the web, not even the dark web. You can go on the web for 4,000 something dollars and buy an equipment that will extract the secret keys, the private keys from the phone, from 
a trusted execution environment. So there are already known attacks today. So no solution, you must use a chip, a secure element. Now, if you read what I wrote on this slide, the payer must have a secure element. The payee, no. We, we, we are able to secure the protocol without the payee. It's quite important, especially for you merchants, because it allows a merchant to accept CBDC payment without a secure element, making things easier. Of course, in that case, the merchant will not be able to retransfer because he would become a payer, and the rule, the rule says the payer must have a secure element. But for, for large merchants, it's not necessarily an issue. A, a large merchant, Tesco, is not going to retransfer. They are going to put the money at the bank, and in that case, we have no issue. So this is good for larger retailers, mid-sized retailers. Maybe the mom and pop store will want to have a secure chip in order to be able to spend immediately what they got. The last point, maybe the most important one, a fully configurable level of privacy. You know that privacy is the big thing about CBDC. A real democratic debate is happening. You see what's going on in the US. Maybe it's a little populistic, but nevertheless, it's democratic. This will happen very soon in Europe, I believe, as soon as the parliament, the council, start discussing CBDC. And people will say, you will hear, your friends will tell you, CBDC is big brother, there is no privacy, it will be terrible, the government will be spying on us. Uh, here you see uh, what the uh, EC, it's uh, the result of a survey from the ECB showing that the number one concern for all stakeholders, the number one concern is privacy. The facts. The facts is that technically we can allow whatever level of privacy we choose to implement. If you want to implement totally private transaction, no trace, no trace. I pay you, my balance goes down, your balance goes up, no trace. It's doable technically. And once again, I would quote the ECB because the ECB is conscious of that and they tell, okay, there is an option, but for offline payments, low amounts, proximity payments, maybe we make it totally private, no traceability. And what they say is, the politics, the parliament, you decide, it's your job. We offer the tools to enable it, now it's your decision to enable it or not. And I think that's the real way to answer. It's a political decision taken by the elected officials. Technically, it's possible, it's not true from facts that CBDC is not private. CBDC can be private. So normally at this point, I've done my job and you're convinced that we can do digital cash, which is as good as cash. But obviously what we want to do is to do better than cash. So what about this programmability thing? What about the idea that instead of being just like a digital version of cash, it can be something that can be used in more in a smart way, like decentralized finance. So let me just give you an idea, an idea what, what I mean. Today, when I want to buy a house, I'm French, as you can see from my wonderful accent. If I want to buy a house in France, you need to go to a notary. And you also have a law that says if you don't have your, uh, your loan, you don't pay any penalty. What would be, so today you need to go to a notary because to check delivery versus payment, I give the money, they give me the title. With decentralized finance, you can do all that in one part. So you pay, you have a title, sorry, you pay, you get your loan, and you have a title. Mathematically, in decentralized finance, you, can, you don't need a third party. You can do all that in one block, in one part, and it works. So this is typically what is doable 
with digital currency. And I think this is what, what will make digital currency, will to make CBDC be not only as good as cash, but even better than cash. If you want to learn more, there is a white paper that we published recently that explains in more detail what I just said. Thank you for your attention and happy to discuss in the panel.